All right, we are back with your favorite podcast show of the week. This is Location Weekly, and it's episode number 453. And we are recording live on February the 25th. Uh, our Brianna is not in Atlanta. How are you? Where are you? What's going on? I'm good. I am in La Quinta, California, which is basically like Palm Springs. Um, just got here for a Digiday Media Buying Summit event for Gather Lab, and I'm at our Airbnb, which I haven't really had a lot of time to explore. I literally just walked in the door. We were supposed to record yesterday, but as you can tell, my, uh, as Steve called it, my barroom singer voice is just now coming back. So I rushed in from my flight, and here I am. But it's pretty nice. It's like 85 out, sunny. There you go. I was just like Puerto Rico last week. So for me. I know. How's it going? How was how was all of that? It was good. It was a really great event. Uh, good turnout. A lot of interesting brands uh, and media buying agencies and folks were there. So I think it's gonna it's gonna be a good market for us. I think uh, we'll get uh, a lot out of it. So I was quite happy um, you know, with uh, with the response. So yeah, back at it. Heavy into retail loco uh, planning now for because we're you know two months away. And uh, yeah, there's uh, there's lots coming coming up, so uh, it's gonna be a, a busy uh, busy next couple months for sure. I know. Can you believe it's like the end of February? It's just crazy. I know, I know. But anyways, that's that's what happens. So we've got a uh, a good show for you. Three industry news stories, three member news stories, um, a, a wide array of stuff. So I'll let Aubriana kick it off with a pretty cool story. Yeah, I'm going to take it back to like my childhood, okay? This is like, I grew up with this stuff. So uh, Pearl Jam, I mean, you know, if you are like, what is it, an exennial or, you know, older, then you will be quite fond of Pearl Jam. Jam was big, so there you go. (laughs) Yeah, well, they're doing something kind of cool because they have a new album coming out. And so they have done this like AR production um, to unlock this so they have a new song right it's called super blood wolf moon and um basically with this ar they can unlock this like moon microsite that you take your smartphone right hold it up to the moon if you can see the moon and um it like has this interactive web experience basically so they're letting fans preview a new song from their new album and they get to see like this interactive thing, but you gotta be able to see the moon, right? So you can scan this QR code with your your phone and view in um, a mobile browser, or you can, I think there's like an actual app. So they are the, the um, let's see, they did this on February 19th. It was released February 19th, so it just happened. And then their, um, their studio album, which is called Gigaton, is going to actually be released March 27th. So you gotta wait a few more weeks for that. But um, they did this with Republic Records and Pauster is the tech company that created the AR experience that they worked with. So, you know, they're thinking about this from, people are moving from just listening to music from it just being like an audio experience and kind of trying to bring in other senses, right? So you wanna have sort of, I don't know. To me, it kind of sounded like psychedelic, like it was trippy, right? You want to listen to this music and then you want to have like this experience. So they kind of want to control what you are experiencing while you listen and hear the music. And I think that's kind of cool how they're tapping into the senses. So I like this idea. You know, I think that something that, you know, a band that has been around for a really long time and, you know, they are trying to do something that's fresh and innovative and also just creating new experiences for their fans is likely going to grow their fan base as well as just, you know, give people like me who've been listening to Pearl Jam for years, you know, um, a new, a new way to enjoy them. So I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's super cool. And, um, you know, I I think the, the, the part that I like about it the most is they've actually like put a lot of thought into the creative around this and thinking about, okay, the song's called super blood wolf moon there actually was a, uh, a wolf moon, like for real, like on February 19th. So that's when they, they- Is that they, a wolf moon or a blood moon? Wait, well, that's what they, like, I mean, it goes, I mean, you can call it whatever. I don't know. I, I guess, okay. uh, I don't know if there's like a blood moon that is a wolf moon too, or I don't know how it works, but uh, I'm not that into the uh, you know, <laughs> all that stuff. But 
you know, from a calendar perspective, February 19th is when this thing happened during this sort of eclipse where the moon passed in front of the earth or whatever. Um, you know, that type of thing. So anyhow, um, yeah, so that happened on the 19th. So I like how they timed it uh, for that. The other thing I like about it is, is that in addition to the AR piece, which I think is cool, is that you can actually, there's a commerce element to it. So, so they're actually trying to get, you know, their fans interested in this, you know, having it fun and engaging with AR, but you can actually pre-order the song. Uh, you can. What's that? So you can, I failed to mention that. Yeah, which is, uh, I think, really like a big piece it's yeah not just the social and experiential part but you, there's actually a commerce component to it which i think uh you know having that call to action some way to actually have people buy the song um you know it, it is is really interesting too so I, I like that they really thought this through they really kind of you know kind of put it all together and i think it's the kind of thing where you know if you're a fan of this band already you know you, you'd probably take the extra uh, you know, time to go out and play around with this and, and, and try it out. So I like it. All right, on to our second story. Now, kind of sticking with AR a little bit, this time uh, out of home company Outfront Media uh, is uh, came up with a pretty interesting Valentine's uh, campaign. So we're just sort of getting the, uh, the skinny on this now. But basically, um, they urged uh, commuters uh, who were seeing their ads to scan heart-shaped QR codes on digital billboards, then act, which then activated an AR uh, filter in Instagram stories. Um, and then they could basically share uh, these Instagram messages, um, you know, with friends or loved ones and so on. So it was called Outfront's Share Love Campaign. And it ran, uh, you know, over the Valentine's Day period. Um, and then if you tagged Outfront and a friend in, in the Instagram story as you shared this, you know, they uh, on the Outfront Media USA uh, page uh, or account, if you will, were, would, would share these messages and sort of amplify them out there. So it was kind of a fun, engaging way um, to, you know, sort of jump on the Valentine's Day bandwagon uh, and at the same time blending out of home and Instagram together. To, to try and drive this. And these guys are big. I mean, they have 500,000 displays across 70 markets, uh, regional markets in the US. Um, so I think their, their reach was pretty significant on it as well. Sounds like this is right up your alley, man. I bet you were just like posting heart filters for Jennifer left and right. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I mean, we don't have this up here in Canada, but you know, if I had I been down there, I would have been all over, you know, because I'm well, such a big We were down here. And, uh, you know, I'm just feeling so in love because that didn't happen. I'm just kidding. Um, I'm not like a huge Valentine's celebrator. I should, have, I should have messaged Jerome and said, hey, man, go find one of these things and get on it. What are you, what are you doing? I know. I know I'm so hurt uh, right now. But, yeah, seriously, though, I think, you know, like, what I like about this is it is social and it's interactive. Um, I What I don't like about it is, like, the scanning of the billboard in order to get the filter. I think that... It's just uh, limits it. So I think there should be other ways to be able to interact with that. But um, yeah, I don't have a ton to add on this. But hey, if you're going to maximize exposure from a Hallmark holiday, as cheesy as it is, then <laughs> you should do it. And it should be social and it should be interactive. You should let everybody know how much you love somebody. Yeah, I will yeah. say that there is a lot of this going on, the blending out of home uh, billboard experiences with social platforms, right? Like we're seeing it again and again. I think a lot of brands are, are taking advantage of that. So, but yeah, I, I, I'll let go. Well, I think what is good about it is that they can see like where their, their clientele or prospective clientele is, right? Because there is a physical billboard and I imagine every single one of those codes are slightly different, even though they may lead to the same place, right? So I think the analytics that they get on the back end is way more excited than way more exciting than the actual like interaction with the filter. But that's besides the point. It's because I'm kind of a data nerd, but yeah. There you go. All right. Next story. All right. So this campaign I'm actually like pretty impressed by, and I think it's really cool. Uh, Puma did a, a new campaign with Havas, their agency of record um and they did this around nba all-star weekend and what's really cool is that they have this new shoe and it's called the sky dreamer and what they did was they leveraged all these parked cars that had like these 3d um 
let's see, I'm trying to, it's called Firefly 3D Hollow Projection Technology on top of them. So think of like taxis that have like the light up, you know, mm -hmm. kind of signs on top of them. Well, these light up and then they also have the ability to sort of this project this like holograph above the car. And so there were all of these like Puma Sky Dreamer shoes just like floating all around the NBA All-Star Weekend. So they did this um, from February 14th to 16th. And obviously, um, you know, this was near all the different Chicago landmarks. Um, and so I think this is really cool. I don't know how much interaction it had or if there was like a call to action in terms of buying it, but for brand awareness and new shoe awareness and for the fact that the shoe is called, you know, the Sky Dreamer, I think this is like such a perfect, uh, you know, kind of activation that they did around NBA All-Star Weekend. I think this is really cool. There's not really a ton of details that I can add there, but I think that this is really fun and um, yeah, I think it's different. Like I like how Havas went around thinking about this and how to, to activate around a specific, you know, place and time, venue, everything that's going on with NBA All-Stars and the crowd is likely the right crowd to be looking at that as well. So it's super cool. Yeah, I, I think it's a super smart uh, campaign. I think the targeting of the crowd, as you said, is, is the right crowd for, for this brand. I think the... Uh, the digital savviness of the crowd in terms of understanding and, and seeing cool things like, you know, holographic projections and things like that works well in that environment. Um, you know, and I think too, like, you know, if you had to pick an all-star game to do it, you know, with the extra attention of Kobe and, you know, all of that, um, you know, on this particular game and everything going on there, I think, you know, it's probably a, you know, a, a slam dunk to stick with the basket. I was going to say home run for a second, and then I just, you know, it's a slam dunk. Um, <laughs> um, you know, yeah, I, I like a lot of the elements of this that they put to, put together here, and I think it, it's just really well thought out. I think it's, um, you know, uh, an interesting thing. We're seeing a lot of this type of taxi top Uber, you know, sort of uh, advertising on the on the tops of vehicles, whether it's, you know, with a, with a static billboard or digital billboards or holographic projections now, you know, that sort of out of home, geo-targeted specific use of media in that way, I think is, is on the rise. And, and we're gonna see more of it. And also in the vehicles as well, you might remember we, we covered, uh, what's the name of that company that we had, uh, that has the sort of in-car selling uh, in Ubers and Lyfts, they have like, they're selling chocolate bars and- Oh, uh, yes. Um, oh my goodness. Escapes me now as well. But anyways, there's a lot of uh, sort of targeting from a media perspective right now against these types of vehicles. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's uh, it makes a lot of sense. And you know, I expect we're gonna see even more of this type of, especially holographic projections like this. So, very cool. So that's our three industry news stories. Um, we'll shift over now to our members and uh, I'll kick it off with another very interesting story. So this is our good friends at Uber um, have launched a new service in the US uh, which is targeting older uh, consumers. Uh, they didn't define older consumers, they just said older consumers who may not have a smartphone uh, necessarily or want to use Uber in the traditional way. And so they've launched a new telephone-based booking service that's aimed at these older uh, consumers. And so they're launching this initially in Arizona. So basically, uh, folks can just call the number. It's 1-833-USE-UBER. And they speak to a live representative. Um, does, so you don't need a smartphone to do this. But you do need to be able to have uh, text on your phone. Um, and so then uh, the person, so that you can get messages about, you know, sort of the ETA or terms of the time of vehicle that's coming to you and a receipt uh, for it. But basically the front end of ordering the Uber and all of that is handled on the phone service and then all the sort of verification receipt, you know, sort of updates on how far the car is from you. They're sending you via text uh, to, you know, a text enabled phone. So it doesn't need to have the app. It doesn't need to have any of that, um, which I think is super cool. They had previously done this in India, Egypt, Ukraine, and Mexico and had good success with it. And now they're kind of testing this in Arizona. So what do you think? Um, snacks are called cargo. There you go. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and when I first read the headline, I was like, okay, so Uber's letting senior citizens like talk on their phone while they ride in their Uber car. <laughs> like, 
like the Uber driver's like, hey, here's my phone, make a phone call. Um, but, you know, I think that, I think this is good. And I also think that maybe it might be missing the mark a little bit, right? So I, I like what they're doing. I don't, I'm not knocking what they're doing. I think that they should completely continue with this, um, you know, work, work around from an app, right? When I think of like an older generation, though, um, I know that like my grandmother has a smartphone and she has no idea how to text. So texting is like the hardest part for her. I mean, apps is like beyond, right? But, you know, texting is also a hard part. So I think that maybe there's like one more step they could go with just voice. Um, but I, I like that they're doing this. I think it's really important. And I like that it's expanding their reach. I mean, I'm not sure that it's like a drastic amount of uh, market share for, you know, senior citizens that, you know, don't want to use the app, but they maybe just have like an older non-smartphone or something that can text. Um, but I think that it's really good. And I love that they are catering to all generations and how everyone is sort of interacting with technology with this thought process. So I think it's great. I mean, I don't, I, I feel like it's um, definitely thoughtful from a marketing perspective. And, um, you know, I would not be surprised if Lyft follows suit somehow or shortly. Yeah, the, um, I, I hear what you're saying about the, the, the texting. I, and I think while I agree with you, I think if, if it's only receiving texts, as in here's an update on how far your driver is and you don't actually have to respond to anything, it might not exactly. be so bad. Um, and you know, the other thing is, it is, like, you know, this, this is something that's happening like here in Toronto. I know it was one of the, the first, if not the first we have at the airport. Now we have these, uh, Uber kiosks, uh, which are designed for, again, people who don't have smartphones and you can go up and sort of order your Uber through a kiosk and then get a, uh, you know, sort of a printed out receipt and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, they're, they're really sort of trying different ways to try and drive engagement around that. And it makes sense too, like, you know, at an airport, you know, maybe, you know, you're having trouble getting a taxi, you know, there's just a lot of traffic, you don't have Uber on your phone, you don't want to go through, you know, installing it right then and there, setting it up with a credit card and all that, you can just go to a kiosk and, and do it quickly. Um, so I think, you know, trying different ways to try and capture that other part of the market that they don't have makes sense. Yeah, for sure. It's great. I mean, the whole way that Uber and Lyft have now been changing things up at like how they work at airports. I mean, you think about like LaGuardia, LAX, you know what they're doing now, every time you fly in, it's like, there's not like just a ride share area. Like you go up and you have a code and you show that code to the driver. And then that driver just takes you, you don't have to wait for a specific one. So it's great in terms of Right. moving people along and not having cars just sit there, which I think was probably part of the challenge they were having. And so um, I think that there's still going to be more, you know, more innovation to come, but they're, you know, they're thinking of new things left and right. Like, well, okay, this is, this is a challenge for this segment. How do we, you know, target this and fix this? So this is a challenge for airport, you know, travelers, how do we change that? So I like their, that they're consistently innovating and, um, I mean, even more so how sweet is that they're thinking of seniors, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, this story is from Sista Sista Company, uh, Digital Elements, my old stomping grounds. And uh, I mean, still my company, just different business unit. But they have actually focused, uh, partnered and um, with a company that focuses on programmatic media called Dwise. And this is um, a European type of a partnership. So they are, Dwise is now incorporating digital elements, technology, their IP intelligence. Um, so they're doing that in order to help campaign success for their clients, right? So what they're looking to do is they can track key identifiers when a website is visited. So things like uh, ISP, is it a wired or a mobile connection? Um, you know, the location. So they're taking in the context of every connection that visits a website without knowing who somebody is so they are you know honoring privacy and anonymity but they're still doing geotargeting kind of as a whole based on an audience and sort of those connecting points so they can they're also combining it with other data sets that they have um, outside of digital element like age gender purchase history other things like that um 
And so they can kind of do that precision targeting as each client needs to. So company is Dwise, which is really cool. I'm like, I need to look into this more. I should, you know, know more about this. And my friend Kate um, Owen, uh, she spearheaded this partnership. And so super happy for her. And I'm sure all the Dwise clients as well are super happy with this new data integration and kind of that uplift that they're going to see um, for their audience targeting um, online. So I like it. I mean, for me, my thought process is like, you've got, you know, GDPR that came into effect. Now you've got like CCPA and all of these other regulations that are coming in, but it doesn't change that marketers and advertisers have this challenge and this need that they're trying, um, you know, they need to have an answer for. And so I, I really feel strongly about this type of a partnership because what is, is going on is like, okay, how can we still reach audiences at scale, understand, have context, have location, have an understanding of who these people are while still honoring and respecting, you know, the end consumer with anonymity and privacy. And I think that they kind of, you know, this explains the way that the market is going. And I think we'll see more partnerships like this come to fruition. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't have anything to add to this. I mean, it's uh, obviously, you know, this better than anybody uh, in terms of, of what digital elements providing, but um, you know, all I can say is I completely echo what you just said. I mean, the new regulatory environment means that we, the industry just has to get a lot smarter uh, in, in being able to, to still reach people uh, in a anonymous, you know, privacy compliant framework, um, which is getting harder and harder to do. But the cool thing is, is that the IP type of data that digital element specializes in is one of those things that, you know, very much fits within that. And at the same time, um, you know, is accurate and, uh, you know, just in terms of data quality is, is, is really quite, uh, quite good. Right. So, um, you know, we don't want to compromise the quality of the data that we're, you know, leveraging, to, to do this type of targeting, you know, just because, you know, it's getting harder to, uh, you know, and less and less, uh, you know, available uh, in terms of what's out there. Yep. Cool. All right. Final story. Uh, this one is super interesting to me. Um, kind of when, when I first read it, I was like, wow, like, why didn't I think of that? Um, so Ikea uh, in Dubai uh, has launched a new campaign uh, it's called Buy With Your Time. And so in, in Dubai, and I, and I would argue in a lot of places, like even where I live, you know, there's, you know, there's not like there's a big Ikea store on every corner. I mean, they're kind of spread out across the, the greater Toronto area in my case or whatever. You know, maybe we have, I don't know, four or five of them uh, across the city, um, but they're not necessarily like, you know, super close um, uh, to, to me anyways. But in Dubai... Um, they've launched this new campaign and what it does is it lets shoppers use time as their currency uh, for paying for things. And so it's, it leverages Google Maps. And so basically what happens is, is you, uh, it, you calculate uh, the distance that you travel from your home to get to the IKEA where you want to buy stuff and you show your Google Maps timeline to the checkout workers um, and then basically they they have some calculation that they do to figure out kind of the distance that you travel and what kind of kind of discount you get on the on the basis of that and so in other words what they're saying is is that we recognize that you know people's time is valuable uh, they're taking time out of their data to, to travel to come to IKEA which is you know maybe great distance uh, for some people and in Dubai, you know, they, they say that a lot of people live, live on the edges of town and spend a lot of time to, to get to where they are. And, and so they have what is called what they're calling time currency. So the prices are based on the average salary in Dubai and then, you know, based on kind of the time taken to travel there. So super interesting, very unique, very different, uh, obviously truly location based in, in, in what it's doing here. Um, We'll see whether it works, uh, whether it's something that is uh, is scalable, takes off, uh, but a very, very innovative campaign for sure. Yeah, I like this. You know, I think that too many times we don't think about, as marketers and advertisers, we don't think about the time that it takes to engage with, you know, a brand or a retailer or, you know, when you're trying to obviously in this day and age with so much going online, trying to kind of battle that e-commerce with, you know, in-store 
traction and how do you attract people to do that? And I think this is a great campaign that's really saying like your time and your effort matter to us. And so we're going to reward that and we appreciate you shopping with us and, you know, coming here um, and being here in person. So I think that it's, you know, in terms of like, it being unique, I think it's like super smart. Yeah. And what, and you're like, why didn't I think of that? What a, what a great idea. Right. Um, and so I think that the more, you know, we see little bits and pieces of this, for example, like target, you know, order in the app and then just drive up to pick up or, you know, order online and have something delivered to you. So we're always considering like how to make things more convenient. Um, and we're talking a lot about that on this podcast, but, um, this is sort of a new way that Ikea is plugging that in and it is so simple, but I haven't heard anybody else doing it. So I love it. I think it's smart and great. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if anybody's listening, watching the show, uh, in Dubai and can try this out, I would love to have somebody come and tell us about the experience. Uh, I actually, you know what, I'm going to reach out to a friend of mine over there and see if I can get him to go do it. But, uh, yeah, really, really cool. So that, that's it. That's our show for this. Dubai, week. Dubai and Ikea. Yeah, there you go. Uh, three industry news stories, three member news stories, uh, a wide range of stuff there from AR to paying with your time. Um, and some, some good IP uh, location in there as well. So uh, thank you for listening and watching. Thank you for uh, your uh, continuous feedback and support. Uh, and so please reach out to us if you have story ideas, if you have updates on things, if you have uh, feedback, if you have criticism, if you want to, you know, give us a, uh, you know, a fist bump virtually, whatever you want to do, uh, we'll take it. Um, we appreciate it. So thank you, everyone. And we'll be back next week with uh, uh, episode number 454. Have a great week. Bye, everyone. Bye.